Today's scripture reading before the lesson comes from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 27 through 31. Romans chapter 3, verses 27 through 31. I'll be reading from the King James Version. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the faith of law. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Have you taken the time recently to examine the condition of the religious world about us? If you have, what have you observed? Do you not observe a lot of confusion? People are confused. They really don't know which way they're going. They don't know which way they've, they don't know where they've come from. They don't know where they're going. And the Bible clearly teaches that that is not God's fault. 1 Corinthians 14, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So any religious confusion in our world today, it's not God's fault. And you know what else? It's not the apostles of Christ fault either. Because in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, Paul taught the same truth everywhere in every church, in every congregation of the Lord's people. So it's not God's fault. It's not the apostles' fault. And again, in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul was pleading with the brethren, don't you think of men above, that is beyond, the things that are written. Now, where has the religious confusion come from? It has not come from God, it has not come from the apostles, and it certainly has not come from the written word of God. What's left? It's us. We're to blame. We've confused ourselves, haven't we? It's not God, it's not the apostles, it's not the written word. The problem is many have shut their eyes and closed their ears to the truth. Seeing they see not. Hearing They hear not, meaning they don't want to hear it. They don't want to see it. The Bible says what it says, doesn't it? The problem is not the Bible. The problem is not God. The problem is not the apostles. The problem is not the things written. It's that we don't want to see them. And we don't want to hear them. Would you say that faith is an important part of any religion? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And faith is an important part of the truth. What is faith? Faith is confidence, it is trust, and it is conviction. And the root meaning of the word faith means to be persuaded. Have you been persuaded of anything recently? And when it comes to your religious convictions, are we almost persuaded? Or are we fully persuaded in our own minds That God is in heaven. The Bible is the truth. Jesus is the only Savior. Are you fully persuaded or almost persuaded? Well, our duty as human beings is to gather that evidence, to examine that evidence, and then come to proper conclusions regarding that evidence. We're talking about some great Bible doctrines, great doctrines of the Bible. Today we're going to talk about faith. What do you know about faith? Anything? Well, hopefully by the time we finish today, if we finish, that we'll have all learned a little bit more about what the Bible teaches regarding faith. So let's just begin. First off, let's talk about the source of faith. Now, when you consider the source of faith, there are some obvious errors. Some people believe that anybody who reads the Bible, all you're doing is you're taking a blind leap in the dark. That's all faith is. That when 
Reason ends. What religious people do is apply faith. Is that like anybody in here? Is anybody in here like that? Who base their religious convictions on nothing? Just a, just a blind, random shot in the dark? Absolutely not. Faith is not a blind leap in the dark. It's not just a grasping at straws, as it were. Well, is faith based upon feelings alone? That is, you, you feel in your heart that God is real. There is no evidence of the existence of God, so you just feel it in your own heart. And all faith is is your own personal conviction. Because you won't accept reason, and reason to some people means that if there's not tangible evidence of God, then God does not exist, so we're just, again, grasping at straws. Is that true? Absolutely not. The source of faith is not a blind leap in the dark. It's not subjective feelings, but it's based on objective evidence. Evidence, what is evidence? Evidence is valid proof of what is actually factual information. Do we have any evidence for our convictions and our confidence and our trust in the name of religion? I say that we do. And I believe if you'll do a little examination, you will find that the most historically reliable document on this planet is the New Testament. Do you believe that? Do a little research. Do a little research and look at ancient historical documents and look at the sheer number of copies or manuscripts, as it were, of the New Testament. And then look at everything else. Now, don't we in school, when we open that history book, if that book says it, don't, don't we believe it? Why, it's in the book. Now, why is it that when we open the Bible, everybody says, well, that's not what that is. We don't believe the Bible. They've closed their eyes and they've shut their ears. Do you know why that the Bible, the New Testament specifically, is the most historically reliable document on the planet? Because it's given by inspiration of God. It's the only inspired book on the planet from Genesis to Revelation. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. Throughly furnished unto all good works. Do we believe that? Now listen, if you read that in a history book, you'd believe it, wouldn't you? What does the Bible say about itself? The Bible says it's given by inspiration of God. Do you believe that? Our faith is built upon evidence, and God has always given man credible evidence. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of, of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God has given us adequate and reliable evidence primarily in two ways. The first one is, or his, the first one is rather the works that he has given us, and that is the created world. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. That means this. You can go outside and look up and say, Wow! This is intelligent design. Who designed all this? Time and chance? Please, come on now. Talk about being irrational. Think about it. What about Romans 1.20? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. If there were nothing else, even if we set aside the more glorious revelation, which is his word, if we were to walk outside and look around and be honest, we can tell and see the glorious work of God Almighty. Is that what happens when we look around outside? Do we see the glories of God's handiwork? But you know, God has also given us a more glorious revelation. What's that? There's something better to establish our faith upon than the created world, and that is his word. John 20, 30, and 31, and many other signs. Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, 
which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Surely we all know Romans 10, 17, don't we? What's the source of our faith? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians, if you would. Perhaps you knew this was in the Bible, but perhaps you did not. Now, most of us would say, yeah, okay, Brock, I believe in God, I believe in the Bible, yeah, 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 but I can't understand the Bible. You need to be like a genius or something to be able to understand the Bible. Now, did you, can you understand the words written in a history book? When you were in school, or if you're in school, when you open that regular textbook up and you look at the words on that page, can you understand them? It may take some effort, but you can read it and understand it, can't you? You think God, who has given us the scripture, is going to give us a book that we can't understand? Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Ephesians 3, we're picking it up in the middle of a thought, but hopefully we'll understand it. Ephesians 3 and verse 3, how that by revelation... He made known unto me the mystery, as Paul says, I wrote afore in few words. Now look carefully at verse 4. Whereby when ye read, read what? Read Paul's writings. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, he said he wrote the commandments of the Lord. When you read, whereby when you read, read Paul's writings, what does he say? Ye may understand. Understand to what degree? Understand my knowledge and apostles' knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you can open up the Bible, read it, and understand it? Because the Bible says that you can. What's the source of our faith? It's not a blind leap in the dark. It's based on evidence. Ultimately, that evidence is the inspired word of God, which in other ages, Ephesians 3, 5, was not made known unto the sons of man as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Flip a page if your Bible's like mine and look at Ephesians 5, 17. Why would this be in the Bible if we can't understand it? That is perhaps one of the biggest excuses that people make today. I can't understand it. Or they'll say, look at all the religious confusion. Rock, all those people can't be wrong. Yes, they can. Yes, indeed they can. Ephesians 5, 17, wherefore, that's a conclusion based on evidence, be ye not unwise, but what does he say? But understanding what the will of the Lord is. Do you want to know the truth? Do you have any conviction? What do we base our convictions on? It's not a blind leap in the dark. It's not our subjective feelings. It's the inspired word of God. So the source of our faith Ultimately, is the Bible. But now let's talk about some subgroups of faith. And really, what we're going to talk about is really two senses of the word faith. The Bible uses the word faith in at least two senses, but perhaps we should call it two subgroups. First off, there's personal faith, as in my faith, my personal conviction, confidence, and trust. For example, in Hebrews eleven six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith, as it's used there, probably means the personal conviction, confidence, and trust that you have in your own mind. Are you absolutely certain that there is a God in heaven? Absolutely certain. Because if you don't really believe that, you're not really going to search him out, are you? You're really not going to search his word. Unfortunately, not all men have faith. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. Now, I you have some asterisk right there. Because some of our religious friends and part of our religious, religiously confused world says that in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, faith is the gift of God. Now, how could that be? And you qualify that with Acts 10, 34, and 35. Well, God is not a respecter of persons. 
That means if faith is a gift that God has to bestow on you and not all men have faith, then what's the conclusion? Then God is a respecter of persons. Well, what's the problem with that? That would contradict the scripture, wouldn't it? At least Acts 10, 34 and 35. So faith, that is in personal faith, is not the gift of God in Ephesians 2, 8. Can you see that? Can you wrap your mind around that? I don't necessarily have all those scriptures up there. But I think you understand that principle, don't you? Faith is the same as belief. When you look, even in the Greek language, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Faith is the same as belief. Look it up. Look up those verses, Ephesians 2, 8. And 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Therefore, to have faith is to believe. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth, who has conviction, confidence, and trust, obviously by the evidence, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not, that is the man who has no personal conviction, he won't obviously obey anything, shall be damned. And obviously when we begin to look at it, to believe is to obey, or to disbelieve is to disobey. To have faith is the same as believing. To not have faith is the same as disbelieving. Romans 10, 16, look at how the Bible expresses it. But they have not all, they've not all what? They've not all obeyed the gospel. And then Paul, the inspired writer, brings an Old Testament scripture. For Esaias, that's Isaiah, saith, Lord, who hath believed? Now they hadn't obeyed, but then the question is posed, even reaching back into the Old Testament. Who hath believed our report? So to believe is to obey, or to disbelieve is to disobey. Faith is used in one sense in the New Testament, and even throughout the Bible, as personal faith. My confidence, trust, and conviction by the evidence, but then it's also used in a second sense. And that is pattern faith, as in the faith. Do you know that Moses was given a pattern when building the tabernacle? That's what the Bible says in Hebrews 8, 5. The theme of the book of Hebrews is the book of better things. You want to, you want to tell you how to get a religious person mad? Tell them that we're under a pattern. Tell them that the New Testament is a pattern. Oh, no. We're not under a pattern. Moses was given a pattern. You think God's not going to give us a pattern? He did give us a pattern. The faith is the scheme of redemption founded upon the blood of Christ. For example, in Acts 8, or rather Acts 6 and verse 7, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests, now look at what the Bible says, a great company of the priests were obedient. What were they obedient to? They were obedient to the faith. What is the faith? It is the gospel. It is the new covenant. It is the pattern given to us. Galatians 1.23, Paul ended up preaching the faith which he once destroyed. Well, what did he try to destroy? He tried to destroy the church, the called out ones, those under the new covenant, those forgiven by the blood of Christ. Jude 3 Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you, watch, that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. That's the gospel which was once delivered unto the saints. And that is the faith. And there's only one faith. Now, the religious world tells us to go to the church of your choice. Go wherever it makes you feel good. One faith is just as good as another. I have a question. Where does the Bible teach that? Where, what, what saith the scripture? Because Ephesians 4, 4 to 6 says there is one body and one spirit. Even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So is one faith just as good as another? Not to God. Not to God. Absolutely not. What about Galatians 1, 6 through 9? There's only one gospel. 
What does the Bible say? I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. What does Paul say? But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. That's strong language, isn't it? So there is personal faith, but then there's pattern faith also. And consider also that's probably the meaning in Romans 3, 27 through 31. Turn with me there and let's look at that quickly. There are some contrasts given throughout the book of Romans, throughout the book of Galatians, and really in, in principle throughout the book of Hebrews. There's faith and then there's law. Well, some people get a little mixed up because generally the simple meaning is faith means the new covenant and law means the old covenant. Now, that's not always 100% the meaning because we can see faith also sometimes refers to personal faith. But many times throughout the book of Romans, there's faith and there's law meaning what? New covenant is faith. Old covenant is law. Now with that in mind, let's read the scripture. In Romans 3 beginning in verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of Faith. What is the law of faith? It is the gospel. Verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified. Justified how? By faith. Where's the word alone there? Do you see it? It's not in my Bible. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith. That is, a man is justified by the new covenant or the gospel without the deeds of the law. A man is justified by the gospel separate and apart from the law of Moses. Do we see that? That's the probable meaning. Verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? The Jews were given the law of Moses. Is he not also of the Gentiles? They didn't have the law of Moses. Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is, verse 31, God, which shall justify the circumcision, that's the Jews, how? By faith, what does that mean? By the gospel. And uncircumcision, what does that mean? The Gentiles. Through faith, what does that mean? The gospel. Do we then make void the law through faith? Are we totally destroying the old covenant by the new covenant? No. The old covenant was a flashing beacon pointing to the gospel. God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Galatians 3, 24 and 25 says, Wherefore the law. What law? The law of Moses. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Why? That we might be justified by faith. What faith? The gospel. But after that faith, what faith? The new covenant. The gospel is come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. What's a schoolmaster? Schoolmaster is the law of Moses. There's another way to prove that no one presently is amenable to the specifics of the law of Moses for what that's worth. Now let's talk about saving faith. Saving faith demands conviction in the man. Who's the man? Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth is the man. The sum and substance of the entire Bible is Jesus. Do you believe that? Jesus is the theme of the Old Testament and he is the theme of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Messiah is coming. More than 300 messianic prophecies dealing with Jesus. But then Jesus is also the theme of the New Testament. Meaning what? The Messiah has come and will come again. Is that not true? Isn't that a simple way to look at the Bible? Yes, and it's true. Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. John 1.41 teaches that. Acts 2.36, Peter says, along with the other apostles, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who's Lord and Christ now? It's Jesus of Nazareth. Do you want to have saving faith? Then you need to have conviction in the man. Who's the man? Jesus. You know, Jesus made the claims that are either true or false. 
you got to love Jesus. He didn't leave any in between, did he? John 8, 24 says, I, Jesus said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. How do you like that? For if ye believe not that I am, look at it, the he's italicized. He said if you believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. What would you think if I stood up here and said that? Unless y'all believe that I am, you're going to die in your sins. Y'all would say, man, he's crazy. Was Jesus crazy? That's because he's the man. He could say that, couldn't he? What about John 12, 48? What would you think the 30-year-old man stood up and said this to your face? He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You say, who do you think you are? Is Jesus crazy? He's the man. What about John 14, 6? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, not a way, the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's pretty narrow, isn't it? Jesus was a pretty narrow-minded fellow, wasn't he? He didn't say we, he said I. He didn't say I am a way, he said I'm the way. Now who else in the history of the world has ever spoken like that? And he backed up what he said too, didn't he? Didn't he? Do you have conviction in the man? Well, what about having conviction in the plan? A lot of people have conviction in the man, but they don't like that plan, do they? They love Jesus, but they don't want to do what he said do. They don't want to let him add them to the church that he purchased with his own blood. Do we have saving faith? The foundation of our faith and the saving faith found in the gospel is Jesus. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which also I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. How? According to the scriptures. There's the foundation of the new covenant, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the man who established the plan. The Lord calls us out of darkness. How? He calls us by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you shut your ears? Are you done? Have you closed your eyes? Did you have a nice little nap? Huh? Are you awake? Because you might just be in darkness. 1 Peter 2, 9. Are you in darkness? But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Does that mean anything to anybody? The gospel declares that Christ built only one church. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my possessive church, singular. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Is that right or wrong? And the church is the body of Christ. Colossians 1.18 and he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. I want you to turn with me to Acts 2. I don't know how many times I've quoted this. I don't know how many times you've read this through the years. You missed it. Watch. Watch. The Bible is designed to be understood. If you want to understand this, you can. Do you want to? Look at Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. Who? Every one of you. By whose authority? In the name of Jesus Christ. For what reason? For the remission of sins. And they were given a promise. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse 41. Who accepted that? 
Then they that gladly. Are you mad? You look I'm awful mad. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Question, why were they baptized? My Bible said in verse 38, for the remission of sins. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day, not two weeks later. Not when they had enough to go down to the creek. That same day. The same day they were added. They didn't join a thing, did they? They were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Where were they added? Look at verse 41, or 47 there. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added. Now look at there. They didn't join a thing, did they? The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You can't miss that. In verse 41, the baptized were added. Am I, is that right? In verse 47, the saved were added. Is that right? What's the obvious conclusion? The baptized are the saved. Well, what were they baptized for? The remission of sins to be added by the Lord to the church. You'd need help. Paid professional help to miss that. Unless you shut your eyes. Unless you've shut your ears. And you don't want to hear it. The Lord's inviting you somewhere. He wants you to go to heaven. Do you want to go? If you don't have any faith, you're not going. You need to have personal conviction in the man, but you need to obey the Lord's plan too. We must have faith in the faith. Have conviction in the gospel. The New Testament, look it up, is absolutely wrong. It's the most reliable, historically reliable document on the planet. We believe what a textbook says in school, but then reject the word of God. There's a problem there. There's a big problem there, and it's not with God. It's not with the apostles, and it's not with the things written, is it? It's with us. The faith that saves is the faith that obeys. I give you God's test of honesty. Are you ready? It's pass fail. Will you hear the truth? Romans 10, 17. You've heard it. I think. Now will you believe it? Do you have faith in the things that you've heard? Acts 16, 31. That's a fundamental part of the gospel. Will you repent of sins? Will you change your mind with regard to sinful conduct? Come out of your sinful conduct? You can do it. The Lord will help you. We'll help you. We're here with you. Will you confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God? You don't have to come up here and confess your sins if you're a sinner. We know that. You've got to confess Jesus as the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. Most people I know in this, on this planet, that is in this state, this area of the world, have been immersed in water for some reason. But it's wrong. It's not right. The Bible's clear about the reason behind being immersed in water, and it's for the remission of sins, to have your sins washed away by the blood of Christ. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. Then the Lord has added you to his church, and brethren, it's up to us to be faithful. Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to walk in the light as the Godhead is in the light? 1 John 1, 7 through 9. Let's find out as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.